to everyone. It's a great pleasure to join you here from uh, from Geneva. I'm well. Um, it's been a long year. Um, it's been a really busy year, and this is a really important topic. Um, so I'm delighted to join you um, and to share with you what we're doing at WHO around the physical activity agenda and, of course, working with cities around the world to help us all respond to the most unexpected uh, events of this year. I have a presentation, but I don't think the slides are going to come up and I'd be happy just to talk for two or three minutes about some of the things we're doing and then hand back to you, Philip, for, for some questions and to build the session with you. So if that's okay, I'll, I'll perhaps outline some of the big things we're working on. Please do. Uh, let's start. I don't think we have the slides ready. Sorry for that. Well, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned how important physical activity is and I'm the launch of uh, a global action plan two years ago. And for those who aren't familiar, that is the global action plan on physical activity 2018 to 2030 and deliberately chosen to be that 2030 because it positions physical activity and sport within the SDG agenda. The action plan is a roadmap. It really provides for all countries and cities the advice and recommendations based on the best science, best evidence, best practice on what we can do to really encourage and support people to be active and through sports, through active travel, through moving every day, get the health benefits. And that's why it will help to SDG 3.4. And you'll hear that it will help a few other SDGs as well. We set a target of 15% improvement in global physical activity. So countries and cities can take that down as a challenge and countries agree to this voluntary target. And the Global Action Plan is structured around four areas. And I think all four of those areas remain really relevant today, even because of COVID, and they were relevant before COVID. The first area is that we need to continue and improve how we promote physical activity and communicate the benefits benefits to you and I in terms of our health, but benefits also to society, to the environment that people are very passionate about, very aware of now with climate change. By walking and cycling more, using less motorized vehicles, we can help in so many ways, the air quality, our cities, and make enjoyable, healthy places, as well as healthy people. The second area of the action plan and recommendations is one in which the cities will play a really important role. And I know my co-panelists um, will speak to this, and that is creating the environments. So the walking and cycling facilities, the road safety, the street design, making cities places people want to come to, spend time in and live healthily in them. But we know we've got a long way to go between the cities that many experience today and the cities we want for everyone, places we want for everyone. And I'm talking the big cities, but also the smaller towns and communities. What does this mean? It means more walking and cycling facilities, making sure they're built into new developments and restored and repaired and maintained in our main cities and, and communities already. We must look at road safety and things like the speed and the way in which we uh, create the safe environments for people to move around. And here it's important for all ages. You know, there's lovely initiatives like cities of eight to 80. Um, there's so much knowledge and I think growing momentum. And this is where COVID has really uh, accelerated cities thinking about the changes. Let me briefly cover that the third area of the action plan is about providing the opportunities to encourage people to come back to sport. And I know with the IOC, the international federations and cities, we want people to play as well as participate and spectate. And we need to encourage people, older adults, those who perhaps have not played different sports or thought that they've moved on. We want to encourage them to come back to new sports and to um, uh, uh, the traditional sports they may have enjoyed. And that means more opportunities. And health has a role to play because the health sector should be advising and reminding people how important in whatever way people enjoy, swimming, walking, uh, team sports, or just going down to the local park uh, and enjoying being active. Any way, every day can bring health benefits. 
the last one, and you invited this, Philip, by mentioning the uh, gu uh, guidelines and standards, a really important part for cities and for countries is to have good governance. We need to make sure it's known it's a priority, whether that's walking and targets, cycling and infrastructure targets and street design standards, but also in health, we need to make sure everyone knows and agrees on the health benefits. And I'm very delighted to update everyone that the global guidelines on physical activity have been updated. We've been working hard. We even continued through COVID with our 27 expert committee. And on November 26th, in just over a month, we will be um, launching the new 2020 guidelines on physical activity and sedentary behavior. And of course, that will bring a pro a prominence and a reminder that even during COVID, we must stay active at home, active in our communities, active however and wherever, because it's good for our mental health, it's good for our hearts, and it's good for our bodies. Uh, so we'll be reminding everyone, and we look forward to everyone joining in that launch on the 26th. And why is this all important? Well, it will contribute to SDG 3.4, the improvement in uh, uh, reducing uh, non-communicable disease, but it will also contribute to the uh, SDG target around road safety and uh, reducing road traffic uh, deaths, and of course, healthy cities, uh, SDG 11. So big picture stuff from WHO, hard work underway, very relevant for cities, and really look forward to some of your questions and the discussion this morning. Back to you, Philip. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, very, very helpful, very instructive for everyone to know what's out there in terms of resources. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions for you. And, and first of all, maybe a question to the doctor um, and, and the observations and lessons over the last few months, because we've seen a lot of reports and articles about um, the risk factors around uh, COVID. And there seems to be a high proportion of people with obesity, diabetes, non-communicable disease who are really at risk beyond the age factor. What, what are the lessons from there? Uh, is, is that sort of bringing um, uh, more strength to the argument of, of promoting physical activity as part of building up the resistance and resilience of our communities? How do you see this? Yeah, absolutely, Philip. And uh, you're, you're pointing to a very, very important point here. The COVID has really brought prominence to the fact that the uh, underlying health conditions that are so frequently mentioned are indeed those very common non-communicable diseases and many people are living with one or more, uh, whether that's high blood pressure, overweight and obesity, um, uh, cardiovascular disease and, and uh, um, high blood pressure. So we are recognising that these um, were there and of course many of your audience would know We've been trying to really raise the priority that we must address the chronic diseases, hence the SDG 3.4, but it's brought to prominence the importance of not only providing the management of these, which has been disrupted during COVID, and that's raising and challenging health systems to continue to provide the essential uh, management and medicines for patients, but also the need to prevent. And of course, you know my area is the prevention and so as your topic is, as, is COVID a, a, an opportunity or is COVID a hindrance to us, uh, the, the, the work we're doing? And I think it's both. We've got to use the opportunity mm -hmm. to um, strengthen our prevention and therefore reduce these underlying conditions this year, next year and going forward. Thanks. Um, let's go very briefly into the economics, if I may, um, because obviously COVID is, 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 is a heavy burden on our economies right now. And you mentioned your, your passion for prevention. What about the economic case of, of investing in, in physical activity and health? I mean, we've seen some ratio. I showed one yesterday from Sport England recently, a, a one to four ratio of, of one pound invested in the promotion of sports and physical activity, bringing back four pounds for society. Uh, what, what sort of studies do you have? What, what's the status? Because often in that debate, I feel that the metrics in terms of economics are missing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's an area we need to strengthen, but we've got some good data that people should use and we encourage others to, to, to really advance this. But we know the cost to the healthcare system because of the cost of managing and treating those conditions we were just talking about. And that can be up between a one to 3% of the uh, healthcare budget 
that's a considerable amount that could be averted if we reduce those um, uh, 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 the causes through physical activity. Of course, those diseases cost a lot more. It's the contribution of physical activity. We can, of course, use return on investments, and those numbers are a little easier. We have a, a data that are, uh, even the promotion of physical activity, which cities can do really well, campaigns, education, mass media, through social media, through traditional media, reminding people and encouraging people, you get a $3 return on a dollar invested by the shift in knowledge and then behavior that you can get. So these numbers are there. And we'll be working on getting some more global numbers, but whether it's direct to the health system or a return on investment on just one or more of these interventions, it is value for money. And uh, we should be communicating that to, uh, to city leaders and to national leaders. Very good, very important indeed. Um, a, a question on something you briefly alluded to, which was mental health. Of course, you follow the systemic and, and holistic approach of health being physical, mental and social health, the notion of living together. But mental health seems to be a particularly risky area right now with social isolation uh, in a number of communities out there, the impact on elderly, the impact on youth as well out of school. Uh, what, what's your view? What's your fear or expectations and on, on that side of mental uh, disease? Yeah, well, the area of uh, um, physical activity and the uh, impact on different conditions, the mental health area, has been a growing area of mm. science in the last uh, decade or so. And I'm delighted to say it was a prominent part of the new guidelines. And uh, to forecast those, uh, the evidence is stronger and the evidence is clear that there are benefits by being active. And I think we all know that because we do feel better when we've gone out for a walk. And it is literally the, the experiences of doing that, the um, consequences of uh, clearing the mind, as people say, um, but also relaxing and having distractions. And the physical movement is really important. So we know uh, very much from science that we can um, support and prevent the uh, risks of depression and anxiety. Uh, whilst also maintaining our cognitive um, uh, skills. And that's really important. And absolutely, Philip, the uh, COVID has uh, challenged us all and particularly our, uh, our mental health. So staying active through this time is even more important. And I'm delighted at the response from industry, the response from providers and service providers to uh, get online and cre create so many more opportunities and whilst it's lovely to be in person, if we can't, we can be there virtually. And I'm hoping that industry will really turn their focus to how to attract more people to start being active, not just replacing um, their gym members with their online course, because I think there's a real opportunity and so much potential in the digital space to, uh, to support and help people. But mental health and being active um, can be improved. Uh, Fiona, we're talking to a lot of uh, city leaders today, and um, I'd like to ask you about some examples and, and wow reaction from your past when you visited some cities and discovered some great initiatives, either in the COVID context or in a normal context, so to say. Uh, what, what would you take out of some of your visits in different cities in the world and what would stand out as, as great initiatives and recommendations to get people more active in terms of the cityscape, the city environment? You alluded to transportation, obviously, but what else? Yeah. Well, I think it's mostly in the city, uh, in, in the city examples, I think it's mostly in the area of the, um, the response to the public open space and providing the amenities to walk and cycle. So we've seen city leaders making <coughs> big, bold, rapid decisions to pedestrianise, to um, prov provide wider or even to start providing those cycle paths. Um, and we know it's the infrastructure that can attract people and support those uh, behaviour change. And people are responding, as we're seeing now, that the cycle, demand for cycle, uh, cycling and the demand for bicycles is just skyrocketing. So I think city leaders who have created pedestrian areas or redistributed space, to, um, and it's a controversial and it's a bold decision, but those cities are benefiting from people coming back out, coming in, we're in obviously socially distanced, wearing masks where it were required and encouraged, of course, um, that we're seeing those changes. Of course, it might be seen as temporary. 
But let's evaluate and see, engage the community, because COVID has provided an opportunity to do things which would have taken years. Why don't we now see how well it's working and, of course, keep the best of those big, bold decisions in place? Uh, cities that have, of course, encouraged and supported um, the public realm by making more space um, is, are getting more people coming back in. So I think that's really what I've seen and been so encouraged by and really would invite city leaders to, to take the opportunity to engage with the communities about these being long term and, as people are saying, building back better. We don't really want to go back to those congested, polluted, um, motorised cities where we can do better. And here's our opportunity. There's other important settings in cities where behavioural change can be promoted. And I also alluded briefly to this yesterday. Can I ask you your view on the notion of active schools and active workplace? I mean, obviously, we spend a lot of time in these settings. Um, I'm sure it's part of your recommendations and guidelines. Uh, what, what's your view on these, uh, these particularly important places? Well, the, the, these key settings you've mentioned are very important. And uh, when we were all back in the workplace, there's a major agenda to make sure those health, the workplaces are healthy and the um, WHO healthy workplace and the initiatives across the board from industry and civil society and the private sector are really important. I think it's now important that we shift because so many are working from home. And uh, this means those support structures, the social and the um, culture to stop working, to have a break, to sit properly, to stand and, and mix up sitting and standing and to maintain the activity levels are really important. I'm focusing on physical activity. There's diet and other behaviours that are important too. So we should continue our work, but adapt and modify to the new working environments for those who are at home. For those still in the workplace, of course, it's a priority agenda. On schools, this is a major area because the data show that levels of physical activity are dropping in children, uh, particularly in the adolescent area. 80% of adolescents between the age of 13 to 17 not meeting the guidelines. And there are competitive alternatives. Unfortunately, they offer a sedentary use of screen time uh, and, and now, you know, watching all sorts of media mean that we're not moving. Children are not moving. But as schools go back and as schools manage both maintaining the education, I am worried about the level of physical activity, physical education and sporting opportunities for children. And I look forward to hearing our answers and solutions and sharing those solutions because uh, we don't want children to miss out in their uh, experiences of being active and sport because they're going to be the next generation playing sport uh, and they'll want it for their longer term health. So very critical area for more discussion. You're talking about sporting opportunities, Fiona, and can I ask you what is your expectations towards the world of sports? If, if we talk about cities and we think of the thousands or millions of sports clubs and federations, what, what is their role in this global picture to promote more physical activity? Do you see the role of clubs being maybe more inclusive, more open to particular profiles and pockets of, of sedentary populations? Absolutely. And uh, prior to COVID, we were having good conversations between WHO and the IOC and the International Sporting Federations in exactly that agenda of how can sports encourage more people to participate and change the sports, uh, modified uh, sports, uh, and not only in how it's played, but even where it's played uh, to encourage more people to engage and, and, uh, and enjoy and benefit. Um, I think it was a win-win because sport wants to have more, part, more, more participants and uh, more spectators, but also we want it a win for health. So we had that agenda, and I think now we need to work even harder and really double up on what we're doing because it's a very difficult time for sport. The restrictions that are necessary from the health uh, perspective and to um, uh, manage uh, 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 and protect people from COVID are having huge consequences on the private and the, the, uh, the non-government sector of sports. So we must work together uh, and, and uh, um, WHO has been helping sports through our emergency team in terms of how to manage risk and reopen. And that is not just a one time as we're seeing and certainly Europe as we go into uh, autumn and winter, 
the uh, the uh, regulations and the recommendations are changing. So it's going to be um, a difficult six to 12 months, but we're going to work together on how to um, secure and maintain uh, where possible the sporting participation and uh, the building sport for the future. So now we, we have a great question from the audience coming in and it, it um, refers back to a session yesterday about innovation and, and new forms of sports promotion. And of course, we're going digitally and I'd love to have your view on, you know, the opportunities and limitations maybe of digital solutions. I know you, you even at WHO had to explore that option back in May when you had to go digital with, with, with your uh, global events uh, to get people uh, physically active. Yeah. So what, what's your take on, on these opportunities and how serious are they? Because some of them were even challenged yesterday by, uh, by, by a doctor, uh, a sports doctor as well. Okay, I wish I'd joined your session yeah. yesterday. I apologize. Um, well, we've been looking at the digital solutions from the perspective of how they can be used to enhance and support people to be active. And I think everyone is aware of how uh, popular the devices that you can wear, the wearable devices, whether it's on your wrist or uh, attached to your body in some way, can give you feedback. And that's been a real change for physical activity because other prior to that, you just had to sort of Think to yourself, have I done enough? Was I active enough? And we have a little bit of desirability towards thinking and assessing ourselves more favorable. The reality is when you have these counters and sensors on you, you are getting direct feedback and the improvement in the science means it's pretty accurate. So we do know whether you've done your steps in the last day or week, and we do know whether you're reaching the recommendations, but we now need to turn that into programs and innovation and fun that can actually get us to increase what we're doing. Knowing how much you've done is useful, but now how to help. We're looking at those sort of programming, feedback, in, um, social networks of how to use digital uh, technologies, digital tools to help people um, in, uh, maintain, start first of all, and then maintain. At the high end, of course, there's always the performance um, uh, devices and the very keen marathon runner and hiker. They're already monitoring, but we're really interested in what are the tools and, and behavior change programs that can be for the, those who are starting out and wanting to be more active. In the other space around the digital way of work and the, the digital life we're living so much more now because of COVID, I think we've got to look at the opportunities to make sure people mix and, of course, break some of this time. Uh, like you, I have been glued to my laptop. I'm sitting now. I often try and mix with standing using my ironing board as my home based stand up desk. Um, we have to look at a very, very non-tech approach, um, but we have to look at how digital tools, digital communications can really benefit all health, including physical activity agenda. Thanks. Indeed, low tech has its advantage as well. Uh, Fiona, we're getting to a close, but I have one or two last questions. One is an important consideration in many countries now. It's about the idea of uh, considering physical activity as a, as a great medicine. And actually, I'm getting into this question of prescribing physical activity. I know Sweden, France, different countries are, are testing these solutions here in Lausanne as well. Um, what's your view and, and have you included that into your recommendations and guidelines for GPs and pediatricians to prescribe physical activity and an active lifestyle? And, and I know that uh, um, we have also uh, Nikki listening carefully and I know in Liverpool they, they've done a lot of work with the local GPs as yeah. well on that front. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Philip, because, of course, yes, it is. It's absolutely a recommended area of the Global Action Plan. There are 20 areas and there's one specific for cities to uh, to do all the, the, uh, the areas we're talking about because we know the cities can uh, provide leadership in this area. But one of the other 20 recommendations is indeed the prescribing or whether it's counseling, assessment and, and reinforcement of being active. This has been long standing because the evidence showing it's good for the prevention of so many non-communicable diseases means that physical activity, counseling and assessment has been part of WHO's HEARTS program that's an initiative which is all about improving cardiovascular health. It's there. It's recommended for older adults, of course, 
for maintaining function and, of course, hearts and minds um, and indeed prevention of falls, which is a major issue as we um, age and lose functional ability. Um, it's also important for um, uh, pregnant and, and postpartum women. So there's lots of opportunity for healthcare workers, doctors um, and other health professionals. I think the physios have got a major role to play as well, can recommend, counsel and, and advise on physical activity to almost all patients. And so I think it's a really important area. There's good examples going on around the world, good initiatives, but it's just not sustained. We haven't embedded in the system. I often say a patient will get asked whether they smoke and we must be asking about their activity level and reinforcing uh, good practice. Indeed, sitting seems to be the new smoking, so they say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fiona. It's been a, a, a pleasure talking to you this morning. Um, one last point before we uh, let you stand up and, and be active. Um, yeah. We're talking to a lot of mayors and, and city leaders uh, today. If you have one minute to conclude uh, this uh, talk and presentation, one minute to convince them in these challenging periods as they are shifting their priorities and protecting their population, what should they do, can they do to keep people active even now? Encourage your citizens and uh, the communities in your cities um, to walk more and use the public open space. Um, so look at your city, look at what you're providing, how walkable is your city and what are the two things, three things you could do and your communities will know them to encourage more people to walk safely. So um, every city can improve and we need to reduce the use of um, cars for small trips, short trips, and it can be done, but it's going to require a carrot and a stick. Make it attractive and, of course, address um, the issues of uh, where you put the cars. And I think cities will improve and get w uh, multiple benefits, more people, better economy, cleaner air and better functioning cities. Thank you so much for this insight. Very helpful. Um, and good luck for the coming months. It's going to be busy. So um, thank you so much. Thanks, Fiona, for thank joining. Thank you very much indeed for joining.